one, sir. Let's go to Matthew 3, please. <laughs> Matthew chapter 3. We're going to go to verse 11, brother. And you got John the Baptist stating here. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, so it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and we saw that baptism earlier in the series, and with fire, as in he shall baptize you with fire, is what that's saying there. Colon, so it's going to describe this whose fan is in his hand, and he will truly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, Lord, and we thank you for this chance for us to come together here at Bible Baptist Church to learn more about you and your word. And Father, just ask that you fill us with the Spirit of God to be able to illumine us with regards to the being baptized with fire, what that's referring to. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially for the salvation that was given by your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And this morning we'll continue our series here on baptisms. And we see here in verse 11 that John the Baptist actually gives three baptisms in total. He mentions his baptism with water unto repentance. He mentions being baptized with the Holy Ghost. Uh, by Jesus, and then also being baptized with fire, which is something Jesus does. God. You might think, well, is that is that the same thing as being baptized with the Holy Ghost? I know I've heard from certain uh, groups that being baptized with fire is the same as being baptized with the Spirit. God. Well, let's, let's think about that. Go to, go to Acts 1. Acts 1. Let's see if we can get some clarification here from the one who's doing that, those two uh, baptisms there. Acts 1 and verse 5. We'll notice that the Lord Jesus Christ says here, and he says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And notice the Lord is mentioning the baptism with the Holy Ghost, and that that's going to come very soon, it's a reference to Pentecost, and notice he doesn't mention being baptized with fire, so he himself makes a distinction between the two. They are separate baptisms, they are not the same. Okay. But Manny, I thought it talked about fire and Pentecost. Acts 2, Acts 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. <laughs> And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, notice, like as of fire, not actually fire. And it sat upon each of them. Okay. So ba Pentecost is not the baptism of fire. That's being baptized with the Holy Ghost, baptized with the Spirit of God, as we've discussed. So then the question becomes, what is this baptism with fire? And John the Baptist actually told you in verse 12. That's why there was a colon after fire. The next verse told you what it was. That he shall burn up all these people with unquenchable fire. Fire that can't be put out. That's what that's saying there. Okay. Your water is not going to work. Uh, that's what that means. Uh -huh. So then the question becomes, what is this special fire? What is this referring to? And this is part of why this is part of this series of principles of the doctrine of Christ, because believe it or not, being baptized with fire is part of that basic thing. And so if you're a Christian and you don't believe what I'm about to show you here, you don't believe basic doctrine according to the Apostle Paul. Not, not me. And not Baptists either. Okay, not the Baptist denomination. This is you rejecting the scriptures. So go to Mark 9. Let's take a look. Mark 9. Very basic thing. Okay. Mark 9 and verse 42. The Savior was the one who was doing both of these baptisms. The baptism with the Spirit and the baptism of fire, right? He's the one that baptized with fire. He says in Mark 9 verse 42... 
And whosoever shall offend one of these little ones, talking about children here, that believe in me, it is better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were cast into the sea. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. What is that? It's unquestionable. Yeah. Where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So I guess the baptism with fire is talking about hell. We can keep repeating. We can say if we were to continue to verse 48, you would see that the Lord repeats it again because really Jesus Christ preached about hell more than any other preacher. And he preached about heaven more than any other ones too. Uh, let's keep the balance here. He talked more about heaven than hell. Okay. But he mentioned them because he's the one that's doing them. And so hell is a basic doctrine. It's a principle of the doctrine of Christ. I don't believe in hell. I'm a Christian. Man. Then you don't you don't believe the basics, Jack. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Okay? You don't believe your Savior. I'd argue that because this is such a basic thing, you can say you can probably say this is a major, but we try to be really nice to people. But this is about as blunt as it's going to get. Okay. Now, what is hell? What in Matthew 23? Matthew 23. Why, why do we even have to have this thing? What, what is it for? Okay. Matthew 23. And verse 33. And Terrible Tuesday here is what I believe this was. When the Lord was acting as king and manifesting his authority and letting these religious leaders low their situation, he says, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. Uh, sounds like he's judging them. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? And hell is a judgment. These people are choosing to die in their sins instead of believing on him that they may have life and life more abundantly. And if they physically die in that condition, they are going to receive the damnation of hell. It is a judgment. But I'm glad this is future because right now the only judgment they're getting is that they're serpents and they're part of a generation of vipers. Maybe they can change if they listen and receive that truth. And receive John, John the Baptist's baptism. But we'll see what that is later on in the series. That was their problem. They didn't receive John in the beginning. In fact, Jesus brings them up. If you don't receive things the way God gives them to you, you, you won't receive them. It's, not, it's God's way. It's not your way. Okay? This isn't Burger King, okay? Have it your own, have it your way or whatever. This is this is biblical truth. Okay. So this judgment exists so that people who die in their sins, they go there. So if you don't believe in hell, there is no place for them to go. There's no judgment for that. See, see how much of a big problem that is? How are you going to explain that? Oh, well, the Lord just ignores their sins. He doesn't acquit the wicked, Nahum. He doesn't do that. I mean, maybe Allah does, but now you're not talking about the God of Scripture. You're talking about a false God. You're talking about the enemy. So you, you take your pick. But this is, this is the situation. Okay? You know, a uh, pastor son often talks about the devil being as real as God. Well, guess what? Hell is just as real as heaven as well. That go hand in hand. No wonder why the devil doesn't want you to believe in hell, because he's going there. And misery loves company. So you want to be with him? Agree with him. That's all you got to do. Okay. Now, look at two sections here. Revelation 1 in one hand and Deuteronomy 32 in another. Because there are many Christians who believe in hell, but then they're not willing to say what I'm about to say here. You know, this is a fact. And I get why, okay? So what you have to do is temper this truth, which is very salty, with a lot of grace. But I don't think it's, you should not state it because it's a reality, okay? Revelation 1 and Deuteronomy 32. So in Revelation 1 and verse 18, Jesus Christ once again says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death 
And if you thought the devil had the keys, he don't. He lost them at Calvary. He had to pass them to Jesus, who now has all power and authority in heaven and earth and all that. So if Jesus has the keys, he's the one that lets people in, isn't that right? Deuteronomy 32 and verse 22. Remember, who does the baptism with fire? Well, according to John the Baptist, it's the one that's mightier than him. Okay. Deuteronomy 32, verse 22, the Bible says, this is the Lord speaking, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. And there's prophecy there. But notice, God is saying that he's the one that kindled the fire of hell. So the second thing you need to know is that God sends people there because he's, he's, he's the judge who renders the judgment. Now, oh my goodness, God is so mean. No, 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 no. God is doing everything in his power apart from crossing your free will to make you not go there. Okay? Everything apart from turning you into a robot because God's not interested in that. And neither are you, even though you try to pretend you are. Okay? Now, what that means is that nobody, now hear me, hear me, hear me clearly, nobody goes straight to hell. Oh, you just ruined all the, all the preaching here. But think about it. Not one person goes straight to hell. Every single person runs into Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Runs into the Word of God. Runs into the truth of creation. Runs into the truth of their conscience. Runs into the truth of morality. Runs into all these things. History. I don't care what it is. You're going to run into truth, and guess what? Jesus Christ is the truth. You're going to run into him, and you're going to do like those monkeys and be like, I don't see. No, you can't see me. You can't hear me. <coughs> and then what you do, because this is right in the straight path, kind of like the angel of the Lord in front of Balaam, you're going to turn around, or you're going to try to go another direction, and all of a sudden your straight path becomes crooked. And what we're going to find out when we get to the great white throne is a lot of people in their lives, the Lord's going to show them how crooked their path was. And every single time God tried to reach them, whether it was through one of his children or through a track or the spirit working with those individuals when there were moments of trial and of distress, and they kept saying no. They're just like their spiritual father, the crooked serpent. That's why their life is crooked. And so nobody goes straight to hell, ladies and gents. That's because God is trying to get people saved. He doesn't want you to go there. But if you decide to die in your sins, well, he'll send you there. It's what you wanted after all. So yeah, it's true. God sends people to hell. But it's not because he did it against your will. It's what you wanted. You proved it with your entire life. Okay. Now, one thing to note, or two things I should say, is one, Jesus Christ talked more about than everybody else, and that's why he didn't want people to go there. He tells you, cut off your arm and, and pluck out your eye. And I was talking to another the other day, and he was giving me a story about him talking to another preacher who laughed at him for believing this. And, you know, yes, I believe that those verses apply to the tribulation and second coming doctrinally, but the, the concept there it applies. If... If you're stuck on a sin and it's because of your hand or your eye, maybe you should get rid of them. You're better off entering the life maimed because God will fix your body if you didn't know that. <laughs> then going to hell. He's going to give you a new body. That's, that's the beauty of being a Christian today. So, you know, I wonder how many people had a moment with God where they were wrestling and then God touched their sinew like with Jacob there and then they got crippled and instead of continuing to crawl towards God like Jacob did, they quit and said, I don't like you, God, and turned around. In a way, God allowing the consequences of sin to do the exact same thing Jesus said there in those verses. And they would not. I'm a Calvinist. I don't, it doesn't matter. It's a false doctrine. Sorry. Now, I believe in free will as a Calvinist. You're going to hear this. Okay? But you can't choose to will things yourself. Well, here's a news flash for you. Something I discovered in my Bible reading. That's why you read your Bible. If you go to Genesis 49, I think in verse 6, you discover the word self-will. God gave you two words for it. 
He wanted to make clear that you knew that the will that you're using is yours. It's yourself. So there's no question now, if you're a King James Bible believer, about libertarian free will. You're the source. Read it. Genesis 49, verse 6. Okay. Since, since free will, the word free will doesn't really cut it for you, I guess. How about self will? That's about as blunt as it's going to get. Okay. Lastly, note that in Deuteronomy 32, that the Lord mentioned the lowest hell, telling that there's different levels to hell. And that's an interesting study, but we won't go into that this, this morning. Just know there's multiple hells. Okay. But you wonder what's going on there. We'll see a little bit of it here. Okay. Now, we see that it's a judgment. We see that God sends people there. Now, now where is this place? Okay, Isaiah 14. Does this have location? Or is it just an ethereal concept? It means, you're, you know, I'm in hell right now because I'm stressed out in my life. My brother Jim looks at me like, man, I heard that from everybody. <laughs> I, sheesh, every single person, I'm in hell right now. Like, what? You're not even close, buddy. Okay? Isaiah 14 and verse 15 the Lord tells Lucifer here, the son of the morning, <clears throat> Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. And notice, hell is down. It's below your feet. You know, we talk about being six feet under. If you pass away, we'll go a little bit deeper. You know, go a couple, you know, 12 miles maybe. That's where hell is. Okay? You learned about it in earth science, but they didn't use the word hell. Okay? They used the word mantle. It's pretty hot there. They used the word core. It's even hotter there. That's where it is. The Bible talked about that place before scientists ever mentioned it. Who would have thunk it? It's almost like God wrote the scriptures. And it's hot down there. Sheesh. He kindled a fire in his anger, man. That's what he said, right? It's pretty hot. And so, yeah. Every single person who, who got past freshman year in high school knows about hell. They just didn't, they called it the mantle in the court. I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Well, I don't believe that. What do you mean? So you don't believe science now? Is that? Okay. Make that claim. Good job. See? Now I know I don't have to listen to you. This is common knowledge. They might say, well, you know, the, the mantle and the core, you know, yeah, it's down in my feet, I believe that, but th those are physical places. It doesn't mean like an immaterial portion of myself can't go there. Go to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23, that's a good question. Okay. And I think sometimes we over-separate the immaterial and the material and don't recognize that they are constantly interacting. Okay. There's distinctions there, and they're separate in ways, but it doesn't mean that they're so separate that they don't interact. Okay. Proverbs 23 and verse 13, the uh, person who wrote the proverb here, which I think is Solomon, I'm not really sure, says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell and souls go there. Okay. You can think of hell like a holding cell. Like we got one over here in Nobles for in the school. Okay. That's like the frying pan. Then later, when all the souls that are in hell are tossed and make a fire, they get, you know, into the fire or out of the frying pan into the fire, it's the same. Where that that came from the Bible. Didn't you know that. Okay. But hell's a place where souls are held until they're judged at the great white throne, and then they willfully admit that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father, and willfully choose to jump in the lake. Okay. But souls go there. Okay. Not souls and bodies. That's where the lake of fire goes. But souls. Alright. What else about him? Luke 16. In one hand. And 1 John 4 in the other, please. 
Luke 16 and 1 John 4. Now what we're going to do is read a section here that many, many uh, individuals claim is a parable, even though God didn't tell you it was a parable. And he used the names of real people here. So what we have here is you having a problem with reading. When it's a parable, God will tell you. When it isn't a parable, he'll tell you. This is a, a real narration here of what's going on. Of what the, at the moment there when Jesus is speaking. Luke 16, verse 22. Okay, this is talking about the rich man and Lazarus. Okay, and they both passed away. 22. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Yeah. And seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And notice that this rich man is in hell and he's in torment. There is torment there. Okay. First John 4 verse 18 says, There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. This is one of the ideas, that this fear, or this torment here, is a torment driven by fear. And I believe that. They don't have fear of God, so they got the fear of man, which brings a snare and brings trials, including the torments here we're going to read about. Okay, They're out of the love of God, so that's what they're left with. If you're in perfect love, that casts out fear. But if, if you're not, you got torment. Verse 24. And he cried and said, talking about the rich man, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And notice that this individual, and it's his soul here, He's tormented because he does. He needs water for his tongue, and he's in a flame. He's in flames. Like I said, the man on the core of hot. And I said, wait a minute, but that's physical fire, man. How does that mess with the immaterial? That's a great question. Okay. And this is why there's two views that exist out there amongst Bible believers, and you decide what you believe here. Either way, there's torment going on. That, that, that's, that's, and that's not good, all right? Some people consider the water here being a lack of the word of God and the flames a manifestation of their fear. And so they're tormented in their soul because of all these things that they're reflecting upon, their lack of the word. They're probably thinking about their lives and it's bothering them. Okay, The isolation. I've heard some Christians try to say that the person being tormented in flames have to be directly in the flame with the flames around them. I don't know where they get that, but I guess it's possible. Okay? Point is, they kind of take all this and look at it as a spiritual thing because it's dealing with the soul. And I could kind of see that, but then that eliminates the idea that the hell is right under your feet. Okay? It loses its physical location, which you can choose to do. As long as you believe it has a location of some kind, because I don't think physical space is the only space, but now we're getting into the deep end. Okay? Or you can take it as it is. Now, now let me help you with this. Okay? Every single Christian who believes that they are a body, soul, and spirit believes that man is more than just a material. In fact, two-thirds of him is immaterial. And we know from experience that my soul controls my body. Okay? Right? Now, have any of you had pain before? Pretty sure everybody has. Okay. Now, what is pain? Is that simply, you know, let's say I cut my finger, when the nerves are processing an electrical signal telling, telling my brain, hey, that there's, you know, there's a situation here with your cells not connected, your, you know, your skin cells and your dermis is, is you know, uh, interacting with air, so it's, there's an interaction there. Is that what pain is? Or is pain the result of processing that physical interaction in your soul and recognizing it as pain? Now, now we're getting into philosophy here. But if you understand what I said, you'll notice that pain isn't exactly physical. See that? There's a different qualitative texture to it that applies to your soul. Okay. 
It's like if you knew about your eyes and how they work, you'd realize that what you see isn't exactly what your eyes are receiving. Okay? Your mind is processing that into an image. It knows about the wonders of an eye. Okay? So when you consider that, maybe physical flames can interact with the soul. See that? Leading to the pain. Now I'll just quote this, Revelation 14, verse 11. It tells you that there's no rest day or night in this location. There's no rest there. You don't have security there. You don't have hope. You don't have peace through the burning of your sin. You're living in fear. See all this ties together? God. Revelation 18 mentions that this place has much torment and sorrow. God. That's how it all ties together. So whether you're more on the spiritual side or more on the physical, to be honest, both of them come together and you get the whole picture. If you take them together and see what's going on, you can have both. If you understand a little bit about the philosophy of mind. Okay? Or more importantly, your spiritual anthropology. God told you you have three parts. Okay? Just never thought about how they work together. Proverbs 13 verse 12 says, Hope deferred may get the heart sick. And guess what? When your hope is, is unreachable, which is the situation in hell, you're going to be the sickest heart there is. There's emotional pain. There's sorrow. Reflecting on your family and loved ones. Okay. I'm trying to say here. Uh, yeah, if you go to Luke 16, if we were to read this, and verse uh, 27, the rich man starts thinking about his family. It says here, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that you may testify to them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Second time. You can't avoid the torment, no matter how you want to slice what the torment is. Okay. And Abraham tells them, they got Moses and the prophets, they need to hear the word of God. So that's the situation there. Okay. It's not like here, where you have good and bad going on on earth. It's all bad down there. There are verses in the Bible that can show you that prove that nobody can get saved in hell. Just straight up tell you. The grave cannot praise thee. Isaiah 38, for those who are curious. Hezekiah said it. Okay. So there goes, there goes the idea that people can get saved after they die. They got to change. No. No, they don't. That's it. This is, this is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Not, not later. Oh, I'm gonna know. I'm gonna know whether it's true after I die. Yeah, you will, but it'll be too late. Okay, you're over there assuming that you still got a chance. You don't. Let's figure it out now. Let's see. Go to Isaiah 66 and Revelation 19. Isaiah 66 in one hand, and Revelation 19 in another. Let's talk about this other place because, admittedly. When the Lord talks about hell in the first coming, he often talks about it in ways that reflect the hell I just mentioned, like in Luke 16, the holding cell. And then he mentions this other place he calls hell that seems different. And so there's a lot of uh, discussion that happens amongst brethren about how to reconcile these things and how to put them together. So I'm going to give you my rendition this morning. Okay. Isaiah 66 and Revelation 19. Isaiah 66 and verse 23, prophecy here talking about what's going to happen there in the millennium. And it says, And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. Notice Jesus quoted that. But notice that's why the place he was talking about was, and he was talking about chopping off your actual hand and your actual eye because the place will be there and people can see it in the millennium. You know, the closest I get to hell is if I'm near a volcano, I guess. That's because of all that magma went up, you know, lava went up 12 miles. <laughs> I don't have the capacity to go down Mariana Trench and get down there. To hear and people there are stories about that by the way they can hear screams down there very interesting stuff okay and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh and you're wondering what's going on here okay what kind of 
kind of hell is this? It's a good question. Revelation 19 and verse 20, talking about what the Lord's going to do with the beast here and the false prophet. And he says, after he comes in his second coming here, he starts destroying his enemies. Revelation 19 and verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. Here you got this lake of fire burning with brimstone. And notice when it's created. Now we're leaving standard doctrine. I'm going to get, get the elders to think a little bit. Because we all know this is second coming. This is, this is before the millennium starts. It's a lake of fire there. Okay. Revelation 20 verse 10. A thousand years later. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Notice where the beast and, and the false prophet are. So same one. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now you got this lake of fire here. You're wondering what's going on? Is this the same place as hell? How does this work? Notice Revelation 20 verse 14. And death and hell were cast into Lake of Fire. They're not the same place. Okay. But one of them is pretty bad to where the fire ain't quenched there. So yeah, I'm talking about hell, but really this place is a lot worse to lake, and that's the one Jesus was really talking about. That's why he said he baptized with fire and destroyed his enemies, burned them up like chaff. He was making a second coming reference. That make sense? Okay. And yet, when he mentions hell sometimes, it's talking about that holding cell where Lazarus and the rich man, or that whole story in Iraq, so the rich man was in hell, lifted up in torments, Lazarus and Abraham's bosom. Okay? Because there's different parts to hell. That's another, that's another discussion. There's the torment part, there's the pit, etc., etc. Okay? And what that means, Revelation 20, verse 14, it mentions that when you go on the lake of fire, this is the second death. You can die twice. You can be born once and die twice, or you can be born twice and die once. And many people wonder, how does this work? How does the second death work? Okay? Because we were spiritually dead, right? And trespasses and sins. So shouldn't this be the third death? Well, let me help you. Okay? Now, let's, let's think about some stuff. Go to Revelation 6 and Matthew 10. Revelation 6 and Matthew 10. Now, the basic doctrine, hell is real. Okay. Now we're getting into deeper stuff. Here. Revelation 6 and Matthew 10. How do I know when Jesus is talking about one, one of these places compared to another? How do I know which is which? It's a very good question. Well, in Revelation 6 and verse uh, 8, if I could find it here, I want you to notice that with the, uh, the fourth seal here, it says, uh, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Hell is going to follow death. Hell is going to be opened up. So it's different from the lake that was made over there in Revelation 19. But it's going to be really going to be hell on earth. God's going to open the whole thing up. Let them come out. For those who are curious, a fourth part of the earth is exactly the Americas. Almost. Like 25.3% 20, of the landmass. It's interesting. Okay. Stuff to think about there. Matthew 10, verse 28. Matthew 10, verse 28. Jesus says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, what's interesting about this when the Lord says this is right. He's telling you to fear God. That's true. But notice he mentions hell and says both your soul and body are destroyed there. But in Luke 16, there are only souls involved. So when is the soul and body destroyed in hell. What's going on there? Okay. 
Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, verse 41. Judgment of nations, right? Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand that didn't decide to help the Jews. This is all after the second coming, right? God. Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And we know the beast and the false prophet are in a lake of fire burning with brimstone, with unquenchable fire. There it is. It's everlasting. It started, never end. 46. And these shall go away in everlasting punishment, but the righteous and the life eternal. God. So this is what you have here. Very simple. Jesus used hell to refer to both places because hell is going to be tossed in the lake. But in Luke 16, he was talking about the hell we usually talk about where souls go. And in Matthew 10, he was talking about the one where soul and body will be tossed. These people are going physically right into it. Right? They're still in their physical bodies when the judgment of nations is happening. Other thing to think about. John 5, Jesus said that all the graves shall be opened and everybody's going to get resurrected, lost and saved. That's just the Bible truth. But we are resurrected in a glorified immortal body. They get something else. So they'll be tossed soul and body into the lake of fire after the judge. And that's how you make it all fit together. Now you do with that what you will. Okay, There's a whole bunch of discussion there. But that's the situation. Okay, They're different, but one gets tossed right into the other. Okay, And your goal is not to go to either one. Which brings us to the conclusion, you do not have to participate in this baptism. This is not required. <laughs> God does not want you to go there. It was prepared for the devil and his angels, not for us. Okay. God gave you the baptism by the Spirit into the body of Christ. God wants you to be baptized with the Spirit like we've seen. He doesn't want you to go into this one, this other one. Okay. If perfect love casts out fear, Jesus Christ's love, the love of God, is perfect. And it will cast away all that fear that has torment. See that? Now let's consider what those other baptisms give compared to hell. Okay? The Bible says when you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. The first thing is you'll be with the Lord. You'll be in His presence. Okay? Instead of being in flames, dealing with His anger. You'll be with them in heaven. Then you'll be with them in the millennium. And you'll be with them in what's usually called eternity future. Forever and ever and ever without end. That ain't going to change. Okay. Jesus Christ said, Come unto me, ye who uh, labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Okay. He wants you to learn of him, right? Because he's meek and lowly in heart. He wants you to find rest in your soul. Okay. For his yoke is easy and his burden is light. You will receive rest. There's no rest in hell, but there's rest with him. He is your rest. When you have the love of God, it's eternal and doesn't, doesn't end. You receive peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the peace of God, which passes understanding, that you might be filled with the fullness of God. You receive a hope which maketh not a shame, because the Holy Ghost is shut abroad in your heart by faith if you receive him. And your sins are redeemed. They're, they're put separated as far as the east is from the west. Which means they're gone. Okay. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And you will have joy if you receive the Lord. Instead of the sorrow that comes with hell. To the torment. Okay. God has a joy that he wants to set before you. Okay, that can de help you deal with any trial. And that's because there are always pleasures at his right hand forevermore. Lastly, in Revelation 20, it mentions that blessed is he that hath part of the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. You won't be part of the second death. If you're born again, if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, yeah, you'll physically die once. But you won't have a second death because you won't be united with a corruptible body again and get tossed into the lake of fire. That's why it's called second death, by the way. Soul and body in hell. No, nope, you'll be part of the first resurrection. Second death has no power on you. Okay. 
We've seen something glorious. It's like the body of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, understanding that, you need to recognize something. The Lord, you know, He's not slack concerning His promise, as some may count slackness. It's more like He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The blood of God can cleanse all people of all sin. It's able to pay for everyone. Not one single human being has to go to hell. Okay. And that's why the Apostle Paul, and hopefully you, Christian, are going around testifying both to Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles, repentance toward God, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And you're telling people, are you saved? Are you born again? Have you repented toward God? That means have you turned to God and told him, look, be merciful to me, a sinner. I get it, Lord. It's not that I do sins and I you know, make mistakes, but I'm decent. No, I made those choices. It's my fault. I'm going to stop blaming my environment, stop blaming my wife or whomever else. It's me. I did it. I'm a sinner. And I can't fix that. I need to turn to you, the sinless one. Okay? Who chose to take a form of a servant and was obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Where you humbled yourself and gave your life a ransom for me. You became the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. By offering up your precious blood that was without spot and without blemish at Calvary's cross to save me from my sins. Because you never sinned. God. So I'm going to trust in your death. I'm going to place my faith in you, Lord, in your work at Calvary's cross. Where you died for my sins. <coughs> And you really physically died because you were buried for three days. But you rose again the third day according to scriptures, proving that your God manifests in the flesh, proving that you had victory over sin and death, proving that you do have the keys of hell and death. That's why you're able to take victory over death. Because you were able to say, oh, death, where is I sting? And oh, grave, where is I victory? And now you're passing that to me and saying, you can say it too because you trusted in me. So are you saved? Because the reality is you don't have to be baptized with fire. Instead, you can be baptized with God himself. What are you going to do? The ball's in your court. And the Lord is hoping and praying and beseeching that you'll receive his son for salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for showing us all these things about being baptized with fire, Lord. And help Christians to recognize these truths and take them seriously so they're willing to witness other people about Jesus Christ and Him crucified so they can avoid this baptism with fire and instead receive uh, the baptism uh, uh, by the Spirit into the body of Christ and be baptized with the Spirit, Lord, so that they may be saved. And Father, we give you thanks and praise for all things, especially for the salvation that was given by your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.